BW Conversations. Today, we're going to talk about IVF, surrogacy, and the ethical issues surrounding them. We have with us an authority on IVF and fertility, Dr. Rajat Goswami, who's worked across the globe. He's worked in the UK, and now he's based in Mauritius. Welcome, Dr. Goswami. So the IVF market, um, it's pegged to be about $36 billion by 2026. Um, what, according to you, would be the reasons for this growth? I think uh, with the number of IVF babies now exceeding 1 million, uh, there's more patient awareness of the whole thing, of the system. People, uh, before IVF, we could only treat 30-35% of couples. After IVF, <clears throat> we can now treat maybe 99.9% of couples. So because people are aware that this is now uh, available, more couples are seeking treatment. More and more doctors want to provide treatment even in remote places. I mean, there are villages in India where they do batches of IVF treatments from doctors going, doctors and neurologists going from uh, large cities, doing a batch of patients and coming back. So it's become more and more available. It's, it's becoming more available. Um, and it's uh, working worldwide. So that people from different countries are traveling with medical tourism. There's more uh, IVF going on. So I think that, I don't know about the turnover, but certainly IVF is not a cheap treatment. Everything we use is disposable. Everything that we uh, have to use during the treatment, after the treatment, uh, it's expensive. Um, I think some places uh, they put the fees up at ridiculously high levels because now people are trying to profiteer and exploit the situation, which is a shame. So what are the reasons for growing infertility in, you know, couples and in men and women? I think with men, uh, the reason why sperm counts are falling worldwide, uh, it's due to stress factors, due to environmental factors, and also due to uh, dietary factors. There's more and more pesticide being used in food and vegetables. There's hormones being used in meat. All these things have some effect on sperm counts. So sperm counts are falling for these reasons. In women, the main reason for the fall in fertility is career women delaying childbirth, uh, delaying childbearing until they've got a lot older. Age is the main factor that's causing uh, an increase in fertility for women. And as women get older, I shouldn't mention that word too often, but as they get older, um, once you get beyond 35, 38, um, other conditions start to develop as well. Endometriosis, fibroids, ovarian cysts, uh, things like that. And then with sexually transmitted disease, uh, that is not falling. Uh, so the number of cases of blocked tubes uh, is also increasing. So this is what I think is causing an increase in infertility. Though, one in six couples uh, struggle to conceive, and one in six couples seek medical advice, 50% uh, will need IVF. So there again, you've got the large IVF market. IVF has come to the rescue for couples, and but what are the ethical issues surrounding it? When I first got into IVF in 1982, uh, there were very few uh, people who were looking at the ethics of IVF, just looking to bypass the tubes and conduct IVF treatments to achieve pregnancy. Uh, by 1985, when I joined Patrick Sepp to the pioneer of IVF, we started looking more at the ethical issues. And he warned me then, he said, this is an ethical minefield. So all sorts of requests will come to you. Uh, somebody wants to use his sister's eggs because his wife doesn't have eggs, not on. Somebody wants to use the mother's eggs for the daughter because the daughter doesn't have eggs. These are other issues. Uh, we have situations where 
of course, with uh, single-sex couples and donor sperm, donor eggs, we get a, a similar situation. But I think the most important thing that we have to look at in every case is the welfare of the child. The other ethical issue is on the commercial side. Um, I know what's happening in India, and it worries me, is that people are doing large batches of patients in remote areas with a small team from a, a central IVS center going, let's say, to a, a small village in Punjab. Uh, the team from one of the cities in Punjab goes there. One doctor, one or two embryologists, or two doctors, one embryologist. They do 30, 40 cases in a week, in three days, five days. There's not enough time in the day for two embryologists to process all those sperm samples, all those egg samples, and make sure that the right sperm gets the right eggs. So it worries me that I don't think the right eggs and sperm are getting to the right patients. Then the ethical issue of micromanipulation of the human gene, of trying to insert genes, remove genes from embryos. Again, one has to be careful as to how far one goes. When we speak about surrogacy, do people usually go through a number of IVF treatments and once those are sort of unsuccessful, then they try out surrogacy or how does that work? And also, um, you know, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about uh, the commercial ban on surrogacy, especially in India and your views on it. Surrogacy is when a, a, one couple's embryos are transferred into a surrogate mother. So we've got a what's called host surrogacy. This is where the surrogate is not related to the couple in any way. The embryo is not hers. The egg or sperm are not hers. There's a different type of surrogacy where the egg is of the surrogate and the sperm is from the commissioning couple. Um, there are different problems with each one. When the sperm is from the commissioning couple and the host egg is from the surrogate, then it, there are more difficulties in uh, the child actually being given to the commissioning couple because the host may decide this is her child and legally and in every other way because it's her egg, she is entitled to keep that child. So that can cause problems for the commissioning couple. The one that is being used more commercially uh, is the uh, host surrogacy where the surrogate carries the embryo for the commissioning couple. The sperm and egg of the commissioning couple are mixed, they get an embryo, and this embryo is transferred to the surrogate. Again, in some countries this is illegal. In other countries, the surrogate has to sign uh, a legal form uh, to uh, say that she will give the resulting child to the commissioning couple. And if she doesn't, then the commissioning couple has some come back in court. Um, then you've got commercial surrogacy like in, in the UK, um, where the surrogate, uh, the commissioning couple has to sign a parenting order to get the, adopt the child. So there are all sorts of things that happen. The problem with, some commission, with commercial surrogacy are on the side of the, the surrogate. I think the surrogates are being exploited. They were being paid maybe 50,000, 80,000 rupees. The doctor was charging the commissioning couple several lakhs, depending which part of India they come from. If they come from abroad, the prices, the fees went higher. So there was a lot of exploitation. Uh, there were cases which featured on BBC, where in one center, they opened a hospital where they would admit all the surrogates who conceived. They would admit them as soon as they got a positive pregnancy test, and keep them in confinement for the nine months. Controlling their diet, controlling their visiting hours, husband not allowed to visit uh, unless they're accompanied, we don't want them catching something from the husband, all sorts of excuses. But to actually imprison a woman who has children, the children not allowed to, and she can't have the children living with her, they can visit her for limited hours in a day, they control the surrogate diet, but this is worse than prison. I think this it's a good thing that they have stopped this, but it's still happening. I still have couples, even from Mauritius, who have gone to India and had surrogacy treatment and come back. So there are some places where it is happening illegally, and uh, 
Of course, for foreign couples, it's more difficult because they have to get the child put on their passport. So there's all sorts of corruption thing going on. So I'm very happy that the Indian government decided, the Indian Medical Council decided to ban surrogacy for foreigners in India. I'm happy that they are trying to control it. But payment to the surrogate needs to be capped. Payment to the doctors needs to be capped so that couples are not exploited the way they are presently being exploited for large, large sums of money. Last question really that I wanted to ask you was that what kind of checks can we put in place, you know, so that uh, surrogacy can take place for people, for a childless couple. And, you know, that is for them, they, it's, they're growing their family, it's happiness. So where it's really required, they can go through with it. So what are the checks that we should? Uh... I think that there have to be clear guidelines as to what sort of cases should be going for surrogacy. And a very obvious one, a woman who's had a hysterectomy for whatever reason, heavy bleeding, fibroids, etc., has no uterus, she has ovaries, she and her husband can have their own child, their own biological child, genetic child, by surrogacy. You can justify that. In couples where they have a genetic disorder, you cannot justify it because you're using the eggs and sperm of that couple. So then we look at egg donation and sperm donation. So the only cases are where a woman does not have a uterus or her uterus is incapable of carrying a pregnancy. And this could be due to previous surgery. She could be born without a uterus uh, or she could have a, a congenital deformity of the uterus where she cannot carry a pregnancy. But there should be a cap on the fee that the couple pays. There should be a cap on the fee that is paid to the surrogate so that there's not this commercial uh, commercial exploitation.